Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hi, everyone. I am joined today with grief expert Ken Doka, and he is actually going to be the keynote presenter at the Afterlife Awareness Conference this year. In 2020, the conference is happening June 4th through 7th in Chicago. If you'd like to register to attend in person, you can do so at afterlifeconference.com. Also, Path 11 Productions, we are going to be down there, and we are going to be streaming the conference live, and we are going to be announcing more information about about that, about our new video streaming service. But for Ken, we're going to have a great conversation today about many different areas of grief. Um, his accolades and bio would probably take about 15 minutes to go over, but he is an author of 27 books. He has sat on uh, several boards, has won a multitude of awards for his contributions to the field of death ev- education. He has been keynoted Uh, all around the world at many different conferences. He has appeared on CNN and Nighttime. Um, He is also the senior consultant to the Hospice Foundation of America and really is one of today's leading voices in end-of-life care, death awareness, and bereavement. His recent research on mystical experiences of the dying is opening doors for spiritual practitioners such as death doulas, mediums, and shamanic healers to offer their services in mainstream settings. He is also a professor at uh, the Graduate School of the College of New Rochelle. and Well, actually now retired professor. Oh, retired. Okay. Hey, congratulations there. Thank you. Um, and is the senior consultant to the Hospice Foundation of America. So Ken, welcome. It's a real pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So when I was going over your background, I mean, you have, it's like, where do you even begin to talk about grief? I mean, you have really touched upon all many areas. And I was wondering maybe a way to start off with all of your knowledge through all of these years of studying bereavement and grief, where, what do you think is really the most important thing at this point in your life to really begin to educate people about? What's the key thing in dealing with grief and death and loss? Well, I I think probably my most well-known work um, involves disenfranchised grief, which is the um, uh, grief that isn't always acknowledged or recognized by others, uh, maybe because the relationship isn't recognized or the type of loss isn't recognized. That's one of uh, my areas. Another area is what we call grieving styles, which is work that I've done with Dr. Terry Martin from uh, Hood College. Um, And that work emphasizes, um, started out as a study of gender differences and then moved beyond that to just talking about different grieving styles that may be related to, but not determined by gender. And of course, my My newest work, a book that's coming out in in the coming November, is called When We Die, which is about end-of-life experiences um, uh, that people have, um, extraordinary experiences that people have at the end of life, either as they are dying or in, in terms of grief. Okay, so those you would say are the three, the three main areas. Those are three main areas. I've also done a lot of work with, um, you know, clinical care for people with life-threatening illness and other things, but but those are certainly three of my major areas. All right. Well, let's let's talk about grieving styles. I think that might be something that our audience can relate to. Um, you know, I mean, many people have said in many different ways and, and times that people don't grieve the same, and I'm sure that there is a difference in, in gender as well. So where can we begin with that? Well, I, I guess maybe just saying it's probably not that gender is one of the factors that affects how we grieve. We originally started out studying Terry Martin and I studying how men grieve and, and of course, really found that um, that while gender was was a factor, culture was also a factor. Um, socialization experiences were also a factor um, uh, their personality or uh, temperament was a factor. Um, So we talked about two different types of grieving styles on a continuum, Um, one being a more instrumental style, which is um, 
more typical of what you might find in many men where they um, they tend to experience grief on a, on a more cognitive and physical level. Uh, when you ask them about their loss, they'll say, I, I just kept thinking about it um, or I felt like somebody punched me in the stomach. Um, and when you ask them how their grief was manifest, they'll often say things, I, I really had to work through this. I really had to think through this. Um, um, it was important for me to do things related to the loss, maybe memorial acts, um, and, and that's what helped them adapt. On the other hand, or on the other side of the continuum were, and this is a continuum, were people we called more intuitive, who often experience grief very much on a feeling, on an emotional level. Uh, that's how they expressed it. They, um, they, 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 they cried, they shouted, they screamed. Um, and they said it helped to process those feelings, to adapt. Now, we also saw people as blended, more in the middle of those. And we also saw people as more what we call dissonant, where <clears throat> for one reason or another, they, um, they may experience grief one way, let's say on a highly emotional level. But for one reason or another, um, be reluctant to express it in that level. Um, so, you know, so that was our work there. And, and as, I, as we said, what it did is it also normalized that not everybody um, really responds on a deeply emotional level, as we often think people should. You know, what's wrong with this person? They're, they're not crying, you know? Right. Yeah. How, how would you feel about maybe talking about the recent death of Kobe Bryant? Um, you know, it's the reason why I bring this up on so many levels, I think, from a female perspective, the world is really getting a chance to see men grieve on a very public platform. I mean, seeing grown men cry, you know, our culture, it's usually like the suck it up. I feel like that there's so much stuff that is happening around this person's death, you know, of and, course. And you hear others just, you know, um, um, really expressing their memories and their thoughts about Colby Bryant. Um, you know, one of the things we really try to do is to normalize the fact that um, that a lot of people grieve in ways that are not necessarily uh, particularly emotive, and but are n no less effective. So we really want to say now again, some people clearly do repress their grief. We don't deny that, but what we want to say is there are many, many ways to grieve, which is really what we always said. Right? Do you feel we that? Practiced it a lot. Do you feel that? you know, tragic death in a sense, um, does something differently in the way in which people grieve as opposed to, you know, watching someone die of a chronic illness or a long-term disease? Well, you know, every loss is different. Every person is different. Um, but do I think there are widespread differences? Well, I mean, I think one is that when you have a sudden death, what you also experience is a sense of trauma. And, and what trauma means is that not only do you lose the person, but you lose a sense of safety in the world. Um, that you, um, that's what makes trauma a little bit different from other kinds of traumatic loss, different from other kinds of loss. In other words, the world seems unsafe. When somebody dies of a disease, um, even if it's an out of order, you know, you, you recognize, okay, they've got a disease, they're going to die, you have time to get used to it. When somebody dies of a traumatic event, it, it affects us in another way. Uh, we experience the loss of the person, but we also may experience a sense of personal vulnerability. Uh, we, we acknowledge that we can't always control everything that happens. Right, exactly. And, you know, again, just kind of going back to Kobe Bryant, too. I mean, how many times has he probably taken a helicopter ride, you know, has, has been in a plane? I mean, fear of flying or a lot of people's fear of, you know, yeah. death in a plane. But sure. But if you're one of those people who regularly rides a helicopter, you know, which happens a lot in New York, where I come from, uh, you know, there's a heliport that drives people to various airports, avoiding the traffic and things of that nature. Um, the next time you step or the next couple of times you step into an air uh, helicopter, you may feel an increased sense of unease and an increased sense of um, uh, foreboding. Right. Exactly. Now, um, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, disenfranchised grief, just to maybe this might be the first time that people are hearing this? Sure. Disenfranchised grief refers to losses that we have that are not necessarily publicly mourned, openly acknowledged, or socially sanctioned. 
So if we lose a spouse, um, everybody knows we're grieving. Uh, people come to the funeral. But if we lose, uh, let's say, a person we're having an affair with, uh, which was some of my first research in this area, you may have to keep that grief very private. Mm, okay. Uh, you know, I, I, when I was doing that study, I interviewed a secretary um, whose boss had died. And unknown to everybody in the workplace, they had had like a five-year affair. Um, and so she talks about going to the funeral with her coworkers um, and not really, you know, and, and nobody uh, understanding or she couldn't even express the relationship she had with him. And, um, you know, and, and she talks about their half joking. OK, let's uh, half hour. Is that enough? Uh, have we shown our respect? Let's get out of here. Let's get a drink. Um, and of course, she's deeply mourning, but nobody knows that. And she can let nobody know that. Uh, but there are all kinds of other losses. We, um, Terry Martin, who did some work on that one as well, uh, talks about the fact that um, a, a significant number of married individuals ha uh, experience divorces. And divorce is one of the significant life changes in which there's no, for the most part, no rituals to mark it. Mm. Uh, so you've had a significant loss, but, you know, your your friends don't gather to mourn that loss with you, to acknowledge that loss with you. And um, and you basically grieve alone. That's a good point. Yep. And, and, you know, maybe because the other person is still alive, um, you know, and it's anticipated that you will move on or, you know, there's plenty of fish in the sea. It, it may not be addressed or really given the space that it needs to be given. I think anybody that has ever been divorced would really say, gosh, it feels like I am mourning the loss of someone that has died. It feels very similar. You are, you are, you are mourning a loss, um, you know, um, and it, uh, on a lot of different ways. So yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, how about, let's talk about how do you integrate the talk of spirituality? Um, into this. I know that you're going to be the keynote speaker at the Afterlife Awareness Conference. Uh, you know, Terry brings a lot of science, a lot of, uh, you know, well-educated presenters like yourself. Uh, and then she also, you know, has shamans there and psychics and mediums and things of that sort. So how, how do you kind of talk about the blend of grief and death and spirituality? Well, um, one of the things that I'll be speaking about is, is, as I said, some of my work on these extraordinary experiences. And I'm very upfront with it, you know. Um, I've been in the field for forty some odd years, um, um, actually forty nine years, uh, almost a half a century. I've been involved in this in this work, um, and um, you know, clearly we acknowledge that people have all kinds of experiences. We talk about, um, you know, for instance, uh, uh, near near death uh, near death awareness, um, near death experiences post-bereavement experiences where people have a sense of the presence of the person. Um, you know, I'm a Lutheran clergyman as well as a clinical sociologist. Um, I don't always understand these, but we can't deny that these are experienced by huge numbers of people. Um, so I think it's always interesting to say, okay, we have to be open to these. We have to um, work with these when people have them. Um, we have to see uh, how they process it uh, and what this experience means to them in terms of their of, of their own illness or their own grief, um, so you know, uh, so spirituality is inherently a part of how people make sense of these. And do you have a specific story or something that you'd like to share that was pretty significant for you? Um, sure, um, one of my most powerful experiences, um, and this is what I call post bereavement experiences, what some people call um, extraordinary bereavement experiences, what other people call um, after death communication. I, I tend not to like the, the latter two because, uh, uh, you know, I don't know that we're willing to say it's communication. Um, uh, we, that seems a, a little bit of a jump. And in terms of extraordinary experiences, they're really not that extraordinary. Research has shown 60 to 70 percent of individuals have these experiences after after a loss. But mine was that a number of years ago, um, uh, a good friend of mine, um, a younger friend who was you know, like a, a kid brother to me when we were growing up, I was actually his his big brother in a delinquency prevention program. Uh, I was in my 20s. Um, uh, was was dying um, prematurely, very young, uh, and he uh, had asked me to be godfather of his son, 
um, and his uh, and when he was dying, he reminded me of of my you know what he perceived as my responsibilities toward his young son, who was just turning four, literally the day after he died. Um, and I, I kept that promise. Uh, I was pleased to say, and still am high, you know, very connected with the family. Um, and then one day we used to take the kid on vacation with us, uh, with my son. And um, and as we were out there one day, as as the kids were playing and doing their thing, I took a walk on the beach after dinner one night, and I really felt an incredibly strong sense of of my friend's presence, my deceased friend's presence. The only way I could describe it is I felt that every uh, cell in my body was being individually hugged. It was such a an overwhelming feeling. And there was also a sadness to it because I kind of felt he was also saying goodbye. He was saying, I can, I can leave now. I can go to where I go. Um, I don't have to um, worry about you. You're going to keep your promise to me. Um, but at the same point, you know, there was a sadness of, of I've never had that experience with him since. And prior to that, I had some sense of his presence at different times. So, you know, so again, doesn't fit in easily with my scientific framework, doesn't fit in easily with my spiritual framework. But but there we go. It, it's an experience that I had. Yeah. And, you know, I'm I'm always questioning those those experiences as well. You know, it's like because I've personally have had them, but then there's that also that part of me that says, well, you know, is that just energy follows thought? Was I perhaps thinking about that person? And that's why I was able to, you know, pull a sense of their consciousness and who they were on earth. And it feels close to me. Um, you know, are these signs that we get from the afterlife and people that we've loved, are they really signs or is it a manifestation of our own thought that is creating that reality or creating that sign? Because maybe we associate you know, pennies and dimes with, um, you know, signs from spirit or, you know, maybe my grandfather loved golfing and then all of a sudden a random golf ball is right outside my house or something of that sort. Um, do you have any thoughts about that of, is it really, well, are know, these really I, signs I, or is this if, more if just consciousness? Counseling with me, I would say, let's, let's, I, I would I guess as a counselor, I don't have a need to really uh, either debunk that. Uh, my my question to you would be, okay, um, what were some of your thoughts when that golf ball, when when you saw that golf ball, and and what did it mean to you, and um, and what does that mean for the course of your bereavement? Um, I think you accept the experiences that people have without necessarily overanalyzing them or judging them. Right. It's true. And, and if it's helping them in their own grieving process, um, then that's great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I think another, another topic that we haven't really talked about, and I'd like to, you know, pick your brain on this a little bit more. And you had wrote a book on it, the longest lost Alzheimer's disease and dementia, you know, in my clinical practice, I, you know, have quite a quite a few clients who are really caretaking for their parents. And I'm seeing on the other end, kind of the caretaker of really going through and processing Alzheimer's and dementia through their parents. So could we talk about how this is another just kind of interesting grief issue? Because, you know, they are grieving throughout this whole process. It does tend to be a long process for them. And, you know, the biggest thing that a lot of my clients will say is that, you know, it's just not my mom, it's just not my dad. Um, you know, I see the grieving in my clients, uh, one person in particular, like where their father was an extremely strong, like well built man, um, very full of life. And then all of a sudden, like, this is happening to him, and they just don't even recognize their father, even though he's there in physical form, but there's a whole sense of the person that is completely lost and the grieving that the families go through. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really, you know, and, and I think Alzheimer's really, you know, and, and other forms of dementia really emphasize the fact that we experience loss in all kinds of different ways. Um, and of course, you know, so Immediately, and and I always like what Therese Rando, one of my colleagues, says about the concept, misunderstood concept of anticipatory grief. Um, she says we're, you know, anticipation is just a small part of it, but when we're dealing with an illness, whether it's dementia or cancer or um, you know MS or any any disease, 
what we're really grieving is we're grieving um, not just the fact that this person may not be there in the future. We're not just an anticipating their loss, but we're grieving all the losses we experience day to day. And of course, that's a, a continued and a constant loss with people to dementia. Um, you know, each day you may see that shared memories um, are no longer there, are no longer able to be shared, that the person's capabilities um, continue to decline. And, you know, and each of those losses is really, in, in some ways, grieved individually. Yeah, I think another impact of that where I've I've seen my clients kind of be in shock or, you know, the, the loss that you're talking about is when their relative no longer recognizes them, of doesn't course. know their name. You know, that is kind of like that identification seems to be so traumatic for so many. I, I think that's very true because, you know, again, um, You've had such a shared experience, and that, and you're grieving the fact that that experience is no longer shared. Right. Now, um, what what are can grief actually be healed? Um, and I say this because sometimes, you know, when people are grieving or if people grieve a loss, I'm not saying that necessarily that there's like this this martyr attitude towards it, but it almost seems like what also isn't talked about is when people maybe can f no longer feel the weight of grief or really feel like that they have moved on. And yes, they, they love a person, but you know, you don't really see a lot of people or I have not at least see a lot of people talking about that. Maybe they have come to some sort of complete completion within their grief of losing someone. Those are terms that I'm not comfortable with. Um, I, uh, completion and healing. I, I think grief is, is a kind of lifelong journey. I think for many people, um, you can expect amelioration. The pain you're experiencing right at the moment of the loss, uh, for the most part, dissipates over time. Um, you're able to function in a very similar, uh, sometimes even a better way. One of the concepts we're really exploring even more now in grief is, is the concept of post-traumatic growth. Um, that people who have experienced loss will often grow in in varied kinds of ways, um, in understanding and in insight and in spirituality and skills. Um, but that doesn't mean that there may not be years later that you may experience um, uh, moments when you acknowledge your loss. Um, uh, you know, when, when my uh, grandson was born, um, the first thing I, I did almost intuitively was to try to call my father um, and then recognizing he died uh, approximately a decade earlier. Um, so and at that moment, I missed him a great deal. And now that doesn't mean I, I had complicated grief. It doesn't mean I was in chronic grief or perpetually mourning. But we, we live with a loss. Um, and as I said, sometimes we grow through it. Um, but it doesn't mean that even years later, there are not going to be those moments um, when we look back and say, wow, um, you know, I, I remember dad, I remember my spouse, I remember my child, whatever that was. Yeah, so, so you're saying that grief is a lifelong journey. That kind of seems like a life sentence, though, too. <laughs> no, it, 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 it's it, it's not because it doesn't mean again we're in perpetual mourning. Okay, but it mm -hmm. just validates the fact that there are going to be times and there are going to be moments throughout the years when um, when you have pangs of of grief, and that's very normal and very natural. Um, you know, one of my cases was a, a woman who came to me. Um, her daughter died um, a number of years before, and she said, "I thought I got over my grief." Um, and then, you know, I was walking in the old neighborhood and I saw her best friend um, with her grandchild. Um, and all of a sudden I realized I, uh, another dimension of my loss. I didn't just lose a child. I lost a whole wing of a tree and I might have grandchildren now from that uh, from that woman, the, the, the girl who died, her daughter, um, and maybe even great grandchildren. So, you know, it's not that you're perpetually sad, but we also have to normalize that, you know, that, as I said, grief is not a lifelong sentence, but it is a lifelong process that at various points, as you look back on your life or as events happen, you acknowledge that there are certain people who are important who you now miss right. at this moment. 
And what are your thoughts maybe on, I liked what you were saying about that post-traumatic growth or resilience within people. How come there can be some people uh, maybe that are experiencing a similar death and people can have that post-traumatic growth, whereas other people may really find that they either cannot move forward, they get completely stunted in life, um, they slip into deep depression, and they just really don't rise above it. Yeah, um, that that happens. And I guess I would say, well, first of all, I want to make a distinction between growth and resilience. Okay. The, the resilient person is the person who can, who can bounce back. Um, and while you need some level of resilience to experience growth, um, um, Often people who are, you know, who are highly resilient, uh, it, it's almost like a curvilinear relationship. Uh, you have a lot of resilience. You're, you're good. You're good to go. You, you handled this loss well. Part of it seems to be the circumstances of the loss, how it was experienced. Part of it seems to be the temperament of the person, the spirituality of the person. There are a lot of factors that affect, um, A, who is resilient, and, and number two, who can experience growth in the midst of what was a very difficult loss for them. Mm -hmm. And can you talk more about this post-traumatic growth, about how people kind of will take this and grow in life and spirituality and, and things of that sort? Sure, sure. You know, we, we know that, um, that you know, um, I forget the name of the woman, but for example, the woman who founded MED, and I just can't think of her name at, at the moment, and I don't want to uh, misname it, um, was a woman who... Um, who was, you know, uh, deeply disturbed by the fact that her daughter was killed by a driver who had been drinking and who had been cited numerous times for drinking. Um, and she really changed our society. You know, when I was a kid, um, I, as a friend of mine once said, uh, the designated driver was whoever could fit the key in the door. <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, but I remember hearing my son and his friends before they were going out, you know, um, arguing um, who was going to be the designated driver that night. And they had a whole ethos about it. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And that ethos was whoever was the, 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 the designated driver, whosever turn it was, and, and to them it was a you know rotating turn, was responsible for getting everybody home. They didn't drink, but they didn't pay for sodas or hamburgers or anything at the bar, you know? Mm -hmm. Everybody else chipped in for them. Um, there, you know, and, and they had a whole ethos around it, which we never would have done when I was young. I'm, I'm in my 70s. Um, so here's a woman who changed our society. Yeah. Um, as sometimes people have as they've grieved. Um, other people's growth may be um, that m maybe they've learned new skills. Um, one of my clients was a woman who um, was a husband of a very beloved high school football coach. Um, and a very shy woman, you know, stayed way behind the scenes, didn't like the, 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 the glitter and glamour that was inevitably her husband's in the small town. And, you know, as she said, I was the, the, the person who happily made spaghetti dinners once a year when the team came over postseason for, a, you know, uh, a party. You know, this guy would host the, the team and parents and she'd be making spaghetti and meatballs and salad and, you know, and putting all the food out and letting people eat it. Um, and then when he died, um, people in the community set up a scholarship fund for him and she learned finances, began to administer the, the fund, um, would, um, make, uh, presentations at high school assemblies. There were two high schools who were eligible for this scholarship. And, um, so she'd make a, a presentation about how to apply for it at a, at a, at a, at a you know, senior assembly. She'd give the wards out, you know, and um, and here was this woman who was once very shy and reticent, who's now um, really fulfilling what she believed was her mission, which was to uh, uh, to complete her husband's legacy. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I guess I, I can relate to a little bit. Um... I'm still kind of going through the grieving process. My mom uh, was recently killed a few months ago crossing the street. 
Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. By, uh, you know, somebody that was driving, it was late at night and he didn't see her. And one of the things that I'm realizing through my own grief process and also trying to figure out like, okay, um, you know, how, how can there be more of an impact made? What can I do? How can I help people? You know, I have this platform with the podcast, our films, but one of the things that I've learned through this process myself and also being a mental health therapist is that what I'm seeing is that there's such a disconnect, um, in what I'm going through where there's like no liaison, there's no one to really help facilitate this relationship, let's say between myself and the driver that killed my mom. Um, you know, it's kind of like here, we are two people, two strangers completely connected and, and bonded over a tragedy yet. No one is helping to facilitate the process of, you know, do we ever get a chance to speak? Do we get a chance to talk to one another? You know, do I have to take it upon myself with some of the research of the police reports and, you know, find this person Would this person even want to speak to me? But, you know, I just think that there could be so much healing that could happen on both sides. Um, you know, and, and for this, this situation that happened, it was an accident, you know, drunk driving, there could be maybe other, you know, feelings and emotions involved. But what I'm seeing is that there is a total disconnect in our society of how th- there's so much more happening in a full grieving process that isn't necessarily allowed or facilitated in some way. So this is one thing that I've been contemplating these past couple of months. I mean, I'm not in a state yet to really kind of drive a campaign on this because, um, you know, I'm going through my own, my own stages here, but it does feel like there's something that needs to be done with that. Maybe I will try to speak out on that. And and unfortunately it's an adversarial legal situation. And the first thing, um, that you're, um, you know, I do expert witness stuff. And the first thing you're, you're the, this man's attorney is going to tell him is to don't say a word. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Because it can it can bite your back. Yeah, that that is true. I and mean, he did he did get a lawyer, you know, right away. And um, yeah, and so you know, you just don't know if like after after stuff, you know, goes through with like car insurance and you know things of that. If if there is an opportunity for that, but I guess I I hear what you're saying is that people can be very fearful that there could be other future lawsuits sure. or yeah. But th- there's such a disconnect, a disconnect in, you know, the community just as a whole and how oh, just yeah, on a yeah, human, yeah. human to human level. It's like, how, how does one person not like want to console him or, you know, speak to him or, you know, just even know how he, his life was yeah, changed. And I'm sure there's know? a part of him that would love the opportunity to, um, to have a sense of, of, of forgiveness from the family, regardless of the circumstances. But, you know, but again, um, here we have an adversarial legal system, and that may be um, a good crusade. How do we get beyond that? Yeah, and and maybe where those conversations can happen, where people feel safe, where it doesn't yeah. f- feel like that there would be any repercussions or, you know, any other legal actions that are taken. But you know, when we're talking about grief too let's say, let's take this example, you know, this man is probably also grieving in some ways that other people wouldn't normally take into account, you know, you know, I often talk about that as, as one form of disenfranchised grief. There you go. Yep. Perfect example. Well, Ken, I'm really looking forward to actually meeting you in person. I think you're going to just have an, an awesome keynote presentation for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. Um, if people would like to book you for consultation or to have you come and speak at their event, where can people find your information? Um, I have a web page, drkendoker.com, um, and they can also email me at kndok at aol.com. Great. Just five letters. Everyone wants to add an E or an A. <laughs> K-N-D-O-K at AOL.com. All right. And for those of you who would actually like to attend the Afterlife Awareness Conference, head on over to their website, afterlifeconference.com. We are going to, in the next upcoming months, we're going to have most of those speakers highlighted on the Path 11 podcast so you guys can get a feel for who will be there. It is an amazing conference. Uh, I can't even tell you guys enough. I have been blessed for the past two years to be down there filming it, but I have taken all that I have learned watching while I was filming into my own grief experience. So I would highly recommend this to anyone. So, um, Ken, great to meet you. Nice to tech chat with you. Thank you very much. 
Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on on over to path podcastcom You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path productionscom and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today.